episode 69 of the Real World Wellness Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Lehman, a nutritional therapy practitioner and the reverse diabetes coach, which is also the name of my website. I help clients reverse chronic conditions naturally through diet, exercise, and stress management. I see clients virtually so we can talk from the comfort of your home. I'm recording a special episode today on how to make New Year's resolutions stick since we're fast approaching 2017. The research shows that few New Year's resolutions actually last the entire year, which is kind of sad, but we have to wonder why. For example, I am resolving again to lift weights to tone my flappy upper arms. I have the weights and my goal is just to do five minutes daily, but I just can't seem to restart this. The reason could be that I don't enjoy lifting weights. So selecting an activity that will give you joy, inspiration, or confidence is important, says motivation scientist Dr. Michelle Seeger, whom I interviewed earlier this year. She also talks about different rewards, making a physical activity your own, and experiencing immediate positive feelings, and how that positive reinforcement leads to long-term health benefits. I hope you enjoy listening to my interview with Dr. Seeger. Let me know if I can help you implement your resolutions to have a healthy lifestyle in 2017. Please remember while you're listening to the show, advice and information we provide is intended to be helpful and informative, but is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment. So I really want to give a warm welcome to Dr. Michelle Seeger on the podcast today, and she's going to talk about how to motivate yourself to make healthy lifestyle changes. But before we get into the interview, I want to introduce you to her. She's uh, Dr. Michelle Seeger. She has a PhD and an MPH, and she's also a motivation scientist and author of the critically acclaimed No Sweat, How the Simple Science of Motivation Can Bring You a Lifetime of Fitness. She is also the director of the Sport, Health, and Activity Research and Policy Center, a.k.a. SHARP, at the University of Michigan and chair of the U.S. National Physical Activity Plan Communications Committee. No Sweat was chosen as the number one book in diet and exercise in 2015 by the USA Best Book Awards. Michelle's 360-degree perspective is informed by more than two decades of award-winning research, individual fitness, self-care coaching, and consulting, which has uniquely positioned her to help clinicians and organizations understand and leverage the emotional drivers and internal rewards of consumers' decisions that lead to well-being and health. She has a doctorate in psychology and a master's degree in health behavior health education, hence the MPH, and kinesiology, her NMS, from the University of Michigan. Dr. Seeger lives with her husband and son, and she ran with the Olympic torch at the 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona. So welcome again. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. Yes. I love that you threw in the Olympic (laughs) torch. (laughs) Well, that was fun. Which kind of leads me to my intro question, which is, how did you become interested in fitness and the science of motivation? Were you always an athlete? Well, I've never been an athlete, to tell you the truth. So I, that, that tends to surprise people. I, um, I got interested in physical activity when I was 12 or 13, and I remember just, I don't know if I was bored or feeling down, down and out, and I just decided to put on, um, to strap on my what was it called? What were they called back in the, gosh, 70s? The, the tape recorder that we'd wear or the, when we jogged. It was the first kind of oh, goodness. music device. And I had Prince 1999. I think it was 1999. It was either Michael Jackson or Prince. And I remember, you know, putting it on and jogging around my neighborhood. And oh, like a boombox? No, it wasn't a boombox. It was okay. It was small enough that you could carry a tape in it. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, it, I remember it was in a summer or spring day and it just enlivened me and, you know, that was kind of my hook and I really haven't stopped being active since then, but people assume because of my work that I'm, you know, super athletic and, and I'm just not, I, you know, I walk primarily for my physical activity when I lift weights, it's usually one or two pound dumbbells. And um, that's how I got interested. And then, you know, when I was at the Olympics, and, and again, that was a that was a personal connection, not because of my enthusiasm for sports. When I worked for, I worked at the Olympics as well as carried the torch. And that 
I think it, it inspired me about movement and physical activity, but again, not sports. And so I, when I came back from working in the Olympics in 1992, I decided that I wanted to begin a career related to physical activity. So that's when I registered, um, enrolled to get my first master's degree at the University of Michigan. And it was through that that we were doing a study with cancer survivors to see if exercise reduced depressive and anxiety symptoms. And we found that it did. But we also found that uh, most people stopped despite the benefits. And I became very curious about, well, why would people stop when they recognize that it helped them, you know, it was good for their health and things like that. So I dedicated my career 22 years ago to understanding how to create sustainable physical activity and other self-care behaviors. Mm -hmm. And that's really the topic for um, today because I want to talk about motivation and um, how that, why is that so important for establishing healthy behaviors? Well, intrinsic motivation is this concept of drive that is coming from inside of the person, inside of their sense of self. They have, it's basically a renewable source of motivation. And so you can imagine if your source of motivation is being pushed on you, if other people are making you do things, feels like a should and a chore and in general human beings don't like to do things from that place and so when we have choice over things now when you're in school you often don't have a choice when you're on a sports team you know you have to do certain things but when you when it comes to what you're going to fit into your life during your leisure time if it feels like a chore most people aren't going to do it now some do but most people aren't and so what we want to do is have it feel like a gift so people want to practice the behavior. And, and it's that want that creates drive to do it. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can explain the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic rewards. I usually think of, and I know you've been involved in corporate wellness as well, and typical extrinsic extrinsic rewards are things like a free membership to a gym or gift cards. And I was wondering if you could just maybe contrast again with, you know, what would motivate someone differently from, you know, internal, that internal space, that want? Well, that, I mean, that's, kind, that's one of the, you know, few core issues that, that people really need to understand. So I'm really glad you asked it at the beginning because it really is the foundation. So the difference between an extrinsic, intrinsic, and extrinsic reward has to do whether you're being rewarded internally or externally. So, you know, if, if you're aiming to run um, because the, the reward is external, for example, uh, potentially, a re well, there's also punishment. Extrinsic incentives can also punish people. When you are, are taking a walk because it makes you feel better or because you feel proud of yourself, those rewards, you, you give yourself those rewards. You note them. When you feel better, you're the one who benefits. Extrinsic rewards are things that you look to yourself outside of yourself. So it's changing the numbers on a scale, which, you know, physical activity is not as a direct pathway as cha making dietary changes. It's important, but what we put in our mouth, you know, it's, it, it, it trumps, you know, or it's so much easier to throw 600 calories in our mouth in, you know, a minute or two than it is to burn off those calories in exercise, which could take some people, you know, two hours of intensive exercise. Um, and so what we want to do is get people to differentiate between the rewards they get from an activity, for example, a dietary choice, Someone could say, well, I like the taste of a cookie, so that's my intrinsic reward more than a salad. But the reality is you also have an energy response. How, does that, how do you feel you know, after you're done with the cookie compared to how you feel after this? And so what I ask people to do, and primarily my, my focus is on physical activity, but I ask people to really start to notice how their choices make them feel because that's one of the best ways to hook people on the intrinsic rewards. That is so true. Um, and my clients, I think, um, after they've been in both spaces, 
um, because in the beginning they, you know, they're making a transition. They, they start, I don't have to say anything. They notice it themselves right. and they will report that back to me. So it's, it's kind of a, becomes negative reinforcement for them when they don't feel good afterwards. Yes, exactly. And, it, and if people think that the reward, the future extrinsic reward of avoiding disease, we, we might consider the idea that disease prevention or quote unquote being healthy is actually a, uh, is a, is a, is an optimal motivator because we've been taught to think that way. But imagine exercising in ways you don't like for this future abstract reward. Uh, you know, the immediate experience is going to trump what what is going to trump it, it, the choice you make over this future ex, ex, external reward that you might get one day. Right. So the very present moment that you're in in that activity, which is a nice segue into, you know, why aren't current health messages working? Well, that's, you know, really one of the things I'm passionate about in helping professionals understand this and individuals. Our current messages are not working because they're, at, they're based on getting us to focus on extrinsic rewards, like changing numbers on a scale but also abstract future outcomes. You know, we've been taught to think about physical activity as a pill that's going to help us manage and avoid prevent disease. But on a daily basis, research on human decision making shows us that in general, and again, I always say in general because nothing is true for everyone at every moment. So we want to, we have to talk in generalities because if we don't, even though it's not true for everyone, we want to understand what happens most of the time to most of the people because most of us will fit into those situations. So um, research on decision making shows that in general human beings choices are determined by immediate feelings about what's going to happen from their choice instead of the future value of the choice. And if we translate that into physical activity or other choices, we can imagine what that is. How I feel about going to exercise at 5 o'clock today when it's 4.59 is much more influential about my decision to exercise at 5 o'clock than any weight loss or future health outcomes I the value of exercise to me. Once we understand that that's how the brain works, we can easily understand why our current approach to promoting, you know, dietary, you know, change. I don't even want to call it healthy choices because even the word healthy in a way biases us to think of these choices as healthy when they're really about self-care and well-being. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, going back to the intrinsic rewards, we're really talking about in motivation what what values, you know, what do we value? Yes. Absolutely. Um, and and self-care doesn't seem to be really sort of top of mind often. Um, but so how would you impart that to someone? How would you want to get that message across? Well, um, in my book, I show I have some uh, worksheets that help the the reader make uh, plans for what they're going to do with their self-care behavior, whether it's getting more sleep or changing their diet or physical activity. And, you know, I am a, I have a, a unique perspective on this. Some people like to get people to make multiple changes at once. And I, in the work I've done with clients, I found that focusing on one behavior really gives people an opportunity to become fluent in their barriers and strategies to overcome them. So when someone focuses um, on a behavior, then then I also want them to focus on what are the what are the immediate experiential um, feelings you need in your life. Is it that you want to feel more relaxed or less stress, or you want to feel more joy or more confidence or more inspiration? And so what we want to do is get people to hook, to link the self care behavior they're choosing with the outcomes they want to ex the experiential outcomes they want to have from that behavior and that's the process through which people develop this positive emotional gift-like relationship with the behavior which is what drives people um to to do it again and again 
And that sounds very different from, you know, the kinds of things that I read about, you know, motivational interviewing or, um, for example, you know, oh, and tell me if, if you agree with this, but it could be something like, well, you know, you want to be able to move so you can have mobility to play with your grandchildren. Right now. So this is a really nuanced issue. And, I, and again, I'm really glad you, you raised it. So it's actually a fascinating issue. What's happened in our approach to helping people is we've kind of jumped from external rewards to high, higher order um, rewards that are based on kind of our, our values and what we really, you know, these meaningful things. And those things are very important. They're very important. Um, but... On a, this is where it gets back to the prioritization and what we put on our daily to-do list and, and what we prioritize in our daily lives. So even though I've, this is one of the reasons why health promotion is a reason is a bad reason for most people, I value being healthy, but I have all these urgent fires to put out. So now if, if playing with your grandchildren creates an immediate positive experience, which is what we were talking about before this, then that kind of goes beyond the value. So there's a couple of things. If, if something people value, like smiling at my daughter's wedding, which is a story I told in No Sweat, um, is going to motivate a, a, a stroke patient to do the smile exercises she needs to do, then, then that is beneficial because it's valuable. But we still, we want people, even who have these potentially future but very personally meaningful reasons, to also connect to the affective or emotional thing where maybe they can visualize themselves actually smiling at their daughter's wedding, which is going to create a positive experience. We want to create those positive experiences. So I, because of the way our brains work with decision making and that I conceptualize the whole sustainable behavior change process as starting with having, you know, intrinsic internal gift-like uh, motivation for a behavior, we want to make sure that that link between the behavior and the experience is there because that's what's going to drive people to want to do it. But then the next issue is despite wanting to go to the movies, that doesn't mean that I make it a priority. So what we also want to do is then connect how feeling better or, or achieving our values actually helps us be the best self we can be. And that's the second issue. That's the permission to prioritize self-care that I address in No Sweat and give people tools to, to figure out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Yeah. It's and, 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 and they're both important, but in my formula, and again, everyone's different, so it's not to say that someone wouldn't, you know, someone would not um, benefit from starting at this value higher order level, but in general, we want to connect, we want to create the desire and the hook for the behavior, and then we want to work on making it a true priority. One of the other things that you emphasize, which I like, and I use this sort of um, strategy, if you will, with my clients, is find something you enjoy. Yes. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Well, it's for that very reason that enjoyment, now enjoyment is one at, you know, way to consider getting a, a, a po positivity from physical activity, but I, and that's the word that a lot of people have focused on, but I think we can expand the experience beyond enjoyment to joy to inspiration, to just feeling better, energetic. So whatever the experience is that you're going to most get into and benefit from, that's going to create this hook with the behavior. And that's why people, you know, a lot of people ask people to pick activities that they enjoy or help them feel good because that creates the link. That's exactly what we've been talking about. Right, because it seems like it's um, a reinforcing cycle. Yes, 
That's exactly right, and it's a reinforcing positive cycle that actually motivates people outside of conscious awareness, which makes it extremely powerful. And in the same way, if you choose physical activities that you don't enjoy and that you don't like and that don't feel good, that creates a negative reinforcer that's going to make you disdain being physically active. And who's got the energy or the desire to put it up to, to consistently practice a behavior like physical activity if you don't like it, right? Exactly. You're not going to stick with it. Right. Absolutely. So I know for myself, and you also mentioned walking, I enjoy walking, and I do a little bit of jogging, but part of what the attraction is is that I'm out in nature. So I'm fortunate to live right by a river, the Potomac River, and um, a marina and a marsh and it's kind of like a nice little sanctuary in there and it, the scenery is pretty. So it's a combination for me of really senses and, and letting my senses, my visual, um, I can listen to birds, it can be quiet. Um, it's all part of that experience for me. Absolutely. And helping people tease out whether, you know, what the, the nuances, the bird chirping, the green, I'm the same. I, I totally resonate with what you said. Being outside and taking a walk, it, 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 has, it feels to me like it has multiplicative benefits. And there is some really interesting research looking at whether people who exercise or walk or are active in nature actually get better benefits. And I wouldn't say the findings are definitive by any means, um, but it's a really interesting idea. We know that being in green spaces, even if you don't move your body, is, is renewing, especially cognitively. So what happens when we move our bodies in green spaces? So, but for some people, they might say, yuck, nature, I want to be in a gym where I can talk to people that, I'm in, that are friends with me. So that's a nuance then. So what we want to do isn't just we want to go beyond feeling good and enjoyment to what are the specifics. If enjoyment or feeling good is the hub of the wheel, what's the sp- what are all the different spokes that will get that wheel moving? That's a great analogy. So, um, yeah. Yes. I like that drilling down to really find out what the experience would be for them. Exactly. And, and that's a, a, something that people, if they write, if they write it down and they give you self-reflection, you know, the things we're talking about are, are asking people have have to become more self-aware. And, and the important thing for your listeners and other people to know is Most people don't know the answers to these questions because we haven't been given opportunities to uh, to do to to learn about them, and so that's the biggest thing: is it takes self awareness. So our our measures and our methods want to help people to raise their awareness about these issues. Mm Hmm. I also like that you uh, reframe fitness as movement. Yes. Yes, and, and you know, when we think about the words that our society has socialized us with and every word, you know, every concept in our life has an underlying meaning. And so, you know, exercise and fitness. Now, fitness might not have the same type of negative associations as exercise, but it certainly, you know, can have some for people. So I ask people to not think about exercising and even physical activity is a clinical term let's just think about moving and getting in motion right Mm -hmm. so that's why I ask people that and I I also say that it can be something that you do while you're cleaning your house you know think about vacuum cleaning you know you're vacuuming you're moving usually with a certain up and down kind of motion. And I would venture to say you're probably burning a few calories while you're doing it. Now, that may not be a pleasurable activity. I don't think most of us, well, you never know. Some people might enjoy it. But um, but that is a, just another way of moving. Yes. And that is, you know, there, I think we need some more research to understand the specific issue. But when people are already doing something and they kind of have to do it, instead of going, oh, this is a chore, you might lessen that experience by understanding, wow, this counts. 
this thing that I really am not crazy about doing or might be bored doing, it actually can count. So that's kind of the flip side of what we're talking about. How can we infuse a should, something that we really think we should do, um, with a meaning and a knowledge that, you know what, this might not be the funnest thing um, on the block to do, but in fact, it's still, it's, it's really benefiting me in, in these other ways. So it helps people potentially value it more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Going back to um, self-care and um, values and, you know, I was thinking what might be min- meaningful to a middle-aged woman with children or just a middle-aged woman might be very different from what's important to a millennial male. Yes. Uh, you know, we know that people, whether it's based on whether you're a woman or a man, whether it's based on if you're in your 20s or 40s or 60s, what's important and valuable to you is going to differ. And that's by individual as well as these types of demographic categories. So that's why, again, we get back to the importance of self-awareness. So when we consider what's important to us, that is how we want to think about and, and we want to put our physical activity within that paradigm. But what we have to understand, either as individuals or professionals, that what's important to us or one person is probably not going to be the same thing for another person. And so that's why our work is to help uh, raise self-awareness about what is going to be most important based on what, what we find, what matters most in our life, what's most meaningful to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think the other challenge is the busyness aspect. And um, and people, most of my clients are professionals. They often get up early in the morning commute. We have terrible traffic here in the D.C. area. And so they really don't see themselves squeezing in exercise in their morning routine. It's just, frankly, too much to get out the door. Yes. Um, so then we talk about, you know, what could you do when you get home? Um, but I find that some people, it just, you know, a couple of weeks will go by, we'll have a conversation about it, but still really nothing's happening. And I usually try to figure out why. Now, sometimes uh, they might even have a health condition like sleep, sleep apnea that's draining their energy. And so we make that a priority to try and resolve that. But I'm just wondering in general, you know, what, tips do you have for people who really are they're kind of motivated but um they but it's also a practical issue of when can I squeeze this into my busy schedule well that's ultimately that's where the that's that's where the rubber hits the road is what is going to make this behavior valuable enough in my in my daily life today not tomorrow what is going to make it valuable enough for me to do. And, you know, that's where you have to dig deep with individuals and help them understand that. And the reality is, is that the other part, the other side of that equation, though, is isn't just to help people identify how to make something, you know, again, whether it's what they need to do, sleep apnea or, or, or physical activity. We also want to help people break it down into very small pieces with everything people have going on. And we've been socialized and educated in our culture to think about hitting the, the, the bullseye the, you know, of the target. But in fact, most of us cannot sustain the bullseye. So what we have to do is say, what's truly realistic? So that's the other side is really get people to focus on not what's ideal. I think we need to toss out ideal and focus on what's realistic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I try to say even, you know, 10 minutes. Just go for a 10-minute walk, you know, and then over, I guess I'm a fan of the sort of the incremental approach, so then they can build on that. You know, maybe they'll do two 10-minute walks, you know, in a week or two after that, something like that. Absolutely. That's, I'm right, I'm, I totally, I'm on the same page as you completely. So we have um, also the, the group that is, is motivated enough, you know, has developed some good exercise uh, habits and they're routinely, you know, exercising, but they're getting bored, you know, or their motivation lags. What would you say to them? Well, I would, I would suggest that 
once you once you stop thinking that there's a gold standard that you have to achieve and you understand that how, your experience in physical activity are actually paramount paramount then i ask people what do you like doing as a kid what did you like doing as a kid you know um who is who's someone fun that you could take a walk with or so you want to just get people thinking outside of the box i mean what happens when you're you're bored with what you eat you think about what else you want to eat and you do it. So we just haven't been taught to think about physical activity in this flexible, creative way. Um, but it truly, it truly is the same category. Um, and, and that's, I mean, it, it's, it's so simple once you tell people, people are like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. So that's one, I mean, that's one of the most important takeaways is that it's, you know, it's, it's your move. So, so, so own it and do it in ways that are going to work and, and infuse positivity in your life. Yeah, I love that. I was thinking of a neighbor of mine who bought like this really cool bike. It's like white with blue trim. And then she wears like a blue scarf on her head. It all looks really 50. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And she's riding around at night, you know, just in our complex. And I'm, I think she got a light on her bike. And I thought, well, that's really cool. You know, she's doing it in the evening after work. And she seems to be really enjoying it. Yeah, no, I mean, she's, she's figured out that she's, she owns it, she makes it hers, and she has fun with it. And that's, that's how we should think about physical activity, is that we want to move it out of the medical paradigm and into the, you know, the, the, the motivation um, paradigm, because that's really what's going to drive us to do it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important to... Um, to think, you know, out of the box, like you're saying, because um, I find some clients really love Zumba. You know, they love, they just love dancing. And so I've loaned a client or two my Zumba tapes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's great. That's absolutely great. I, You know, again, because Zumba, it's, you know, no one's going to do it who doesn't have fun doing it, right? Right. So, so yes. So it's really, uh, it's, it's, that, that's the message we want to get to people. Yeah, and I think, you know, going back to, I love what you said, what did you like as a kid? Because, you know, I loved roller skating. And yet, when I think about it, logically, I live, you know, on a fairly quiet street. I, I don't know if you remember cul-de-sac. Yeah. But those were ideal for roller skating. And, you know, but somehow, I think when you get older, you get a little more scared. What if I fall? What if I hurt myself? Yeah. You know, that those things go through your mind that kind of prevent you sometimes from reaching out and doing something that you actually really might enjoy. That's exact. That, you, you, you couldn't have said it any better than that. Absolutely. So how do you kind of overcome that? <sighs> you know, I, I really, it, it all comes back to self-awareness. You really have to understand who you are, what you want, what matters to you, and understand what your barriers are. I mean, you just, you, you, people have got to become proactive. And I mean, either a coach helps people identify these things and directs them, which is why you hire a coach, right? Because they have a process in place that can help you. And if people don't work with a coach and they do want to make changes for certain reasons, especially I find that once people really think about the idea that this is about self-care, this is about the fact that, if they don't fuel themselves, no one else is going to. Once people start to recognize those, the meanings, this core notion of if I don't take care of myself, no one else is going to, and I'm going to feel fatigued and depressed and maybe even and likely even at some point get sick because that's the way our bodies work if I don't make this choice. And again, it's not the sickness that's going to motivate people. It's just the, the whole concept of, Am I taking care of myself? And and that is a just it's kind of a profound point to ask to get people at. And then you know some people decide you know what I'm not taking care of myself, and either I'm not in a place in my life where I can afford to. And that's probably a really good decision. If a mother with three with children, a single mother who works three jobs to make ends meet, recognizes that she just can't fit in time to go to the gym, but she could fit in time to take a walk around the block with her kids, 
that's a beautiful awareness. Um, we want we don't want people shooting on themselves, shooting on themselves because that creates stress and stress is bad. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you. Uh, getting rid of the shoulds and um, finding what you know what they enjoy and what they have time for. Yes. So I know in your book, uh, No Sweat is the short title, but it, you provide a step-by-step program for staying motivated to exercise. So I was wondering if you could just briefly describe your book, maybe some of the highlights Sh- or the chapters. Sure. So um, No Sweat is divided into the four-point program. You know, I developed in response to the knowledge of that study that, wow, people who face death don't feel comfortable making their own self-care a priority. Why is that and what can we change? Um, so that people will do it. Um, the the book was written out of that core um, knowledge gap, but it's really relevant to everyone because the exercises in the book can be tailored to every person's situation. And it's organized around the core principles of MAPS um, that, I, that I identified in my work about what leads to sustainable physical activity. It's the meaning of a behavior. Is it a chore or a gift? What awareness, raising awareness, what beliefs do you have about this behavior? Are they helping or hurting you? What beliefs do you have about the role that self-care plays in your, in your life? Is that helping or hurting you? Um, permission, do you give yourself permission to prioritize self-care? Do you view self-care as optional or essential? And then finally, strategy is, okay, once we've shifted people's relationships with these behaviors, what are, what's the nitty-gritty what are, what are the goals? What are the logistics of sustaining that behavior for life? And that's the last part of the book, which is strategy. Mm, it really sounds wonderful. Well, thank you. Thanks for your interest in my work. Absolutely. And the book is available on Amazon, and I'll provide a link to it in the show notes. So this has been a pleasure, Michelle. I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you so much for your interest in my work. It was a pleasure to meet you. And listeners, you can also learn more about Michelle at michelleseeker.com. Next episode, I will be interviewing Dr. Julie Meyer, who's an integrative veterinarian, about what integrative veterinarian medicine is, how that differs from traditional veterinarian training and practice, and how she approaches various chronic conditions that are common among pets. So stay tuned for that episode.